Excellent. And hey, and welcome to Genius Tea Time. Thank you all so much for being part of this. This has really been very cool. I'm, I'm really thrilled Pamela and I are doing this together and that all of you are joining us. So Rachel Ungerer, in her own words, is a Bay Area queer disabled artist. She earned a BA in Fine Arts from UCLA with a focus in painting, and her work has been shown in LA, Louisville, Kentucky, San Francisco, Mill Valley, Palo Alto, and Oakland. After developing a constant chronic pain condition that limits the use of both hands, she retrained herself to paint by working with her disabled body, and she exaggerates human form and uses gestural brush strokes to capture fleeting feelings. By publicly identifying as someone uh, with an invisible disability, Unger hopes to promote greater awareness and confront discriminato discriminatory social norms. Her new paintings explore the intersection of queerness and disability through sexuality. In the quiet, intimate moments that we create for ourselves, we are without the stigmas and expectations that call us abnormal. We are beautiful and sensual as we are. In our unedited form, queer and disabled forms, accessibility needs and all. And we're going to be, parts of the proceeds are going to be going to benefit Diversability. And Rachel, would you like to tell us about Diversability? Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a, for visual, I'm a pale skinned, white, queer, disabled woman. And uh, yes, Diversability is an online group that I am part of. And it really changed my life. I never knew any other disabled people until I joined this group. And it's actually an international group on Facebook that you can join totally for free, connect with other people. People will share what they're doing and it's made by disabled people. And there's also um, another part that you can subscribe for called the Diversability Leadership Committee. And the Diversability Leadership Committee is something I'm part of because they share job availabilities, speaking opportunities, and people coordinate with each other to really uplift the disabled community and celebrate who we are and give ourselves more opportunities. So I can't say enough about diversity. They made this shirt, which says disability is not a dirty word in white on blue. So yeah, they, uh, they're the reason I know any other disabled people except for randomly. So I love that. Um, yeah, what was the next question? And the next one is, what are we here to talk about? Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk about celebrating disabled sexuality through kink or BDSM. I use those words interchangeably. BDSM means bondage, domination, submission, sadomasochism. Um, and I, I will use the word kink to mean BDSM from here on out. But I really, this is something I explore a lot in my art, um, which I'm gonna show you a little bit while we talk. So one of the things, there are a lot of different factors why I think kink is basically made for disabled people and a lot of us are good at it, which is great um, because first it has built into the concept of the kink community is pre-negotiation where you discuss your desires and your consent and what would be a hindrance to those desires and whether you're hard known. And then there's also, um, there's also this like, joy of exploration, of discovering your own connection to different kinks and not just trying to have your sexuality look like everybody else's. So I think that part really connects for lots of people. And then the third thing is this concept of aftercare and mutual care. And those three things are why I, as a disabled person, love kink and want to share that concept with other people. Um, so talking about pre-negotiation and consent, one of the things I have to teach people is about my body and how to interact with my body. And 
I don't use mobility aids. It's not necessarily obvious to see with your eyes if you don't know me very well where my disability might be affecting me that day. And for me myself, it changes moment to moment too. So the pre-negotiation gives me space to discuss that with someone in a way that they're going to discuss how their body is too. Like we're both discussing this. It's not just me as a disabled person needing to share. And that part's great. But I can also talk about my desires and what, what I'm into and what I'm not into. And my hard no's are no. Like there's no, you don't play with my hard no. I won't play with you if you play with my hard nose. Um, but they have, breathe, I need a cup of tea, hold on. So I can teach people about my disabled body and I can also teach people what my body actually enjoys and what I'm actually into. And I think that a lot of people, when they get stressed or frustrated about their own sexuality, what's happening is they're comparing themselves to other people. And usually it's not even other people's reality. It's this rom-com Hollywood idea of what sexuality is supposed to look like. And even if you're straight and able-bodied, most people don't fit into a rom-com ideal. And so kink allows us to explore what we actually like, what, what, what we're actually into. And I am going to show a picture that describes that. This painting is called My Power, My Love. And we have on the right a person in a wheelchair pulling the collar of their submissive who's on the left, and they're about to make out. Um, and in this painting, the person who's obviously disabled in a wheelchair is playing a dominant role and it's hot and it's sexy. You know, and that, that's really what I like to share is like, what, what do we like when we're on our own, when we're ourselves, when we're not what society expects, but we're us? And how is that hot and beautiful and desirable in a way that might be un unexpected. Like there are aspects of, so many aspects of my sexuality that I have discovered after becoming disabled. And I enjoy all of it more since then. Um, and the thing I like about this painting is it really thinks about the mental aspect of consensual power play where there's a dominant and a submissive and the, the dominant holds the power. And what's cool about that is like when my body might not be having a good day, then I can still access that power play through the mental aspect. And the mind is like the biggest tool in my sexual arson to access it that way. And if I'm feeling great and if I'm having a good day, maybe I could do some impact play or acts of service, other things. Impact play is like banking and such. Acts of service would be like, well, there's a lot of those, but like doing something the other person likes because it makes them happy. Um, and making them happy makes you happy, that kind of thing. Um, sorry, I'm going to try to define terms as I say them. I'm going to just let you know I was in a car accident recently and I'm doing the best I can to keep all my words in order. So if you guys have any questions about anything I say, please just let me know. Um, You're doing great. And is okay. it helpful if people put questions in the chat so you can see them come up? Totally. I can see them on the other screen. Perfect. Okay. Let's show another painting. So this painting is called Reclaiming My Body Impact Play. And so this is a demonstration of impact play. And we have a person with a brace on their ankle who's being spanked and there's bruises on their butt. Um, so this is an example of impact play, but also it's an example of this feeling I really like when I think about kink and disability. 
And I think that people can easily recognize how the more dominant person in this painting is, is wielding powers in their strength. And I think that sometimes people don't understand the position of the submissive. And what I think is really cool about Hank is that I can be a person who is fully in my power and I know who I am. And the world outside of this moment is actively trying to strip me of my rights intentionally on purpose as a queer disabled woman. They wanna take my power away. And I get to say, no, this is my power. I know what it is. And I choose to give it to this person, not to the world who wants to steal it, but I choose who gets to have my power. And that I think is so empowering for me as a submissive to be able to choose where my power belongs and only to someone who earns it and who earns it in a way that works for me, not work for Joe, Bob, whoever, no? Um, so that's one of the really cool things. Another like, God, I could talk about the subject for a while, so I'm trying to stay on topic. Um, as a person with chronic pain, I actually find impact play really healing. I remember a friend of mine asking if sex hurts me. And I thought about it for a while. And I was like, well, it has, but these days, not really. And because I know who I am, I know my body, I can discuss that with the pre-negotiation. But then I can also do things like this. I can do with impact play or other stimulus. And then my body experiences those endorphins and that pleasure. And so I'm in constant pain all the time. And so now I can be in constant pain and feel this pleasure at the same time. And it doesn't get rid of the pain. The pain never goes away, but it does sort of break the cycle and the intensity and allows me to enjoy in my fullness a different experience, even if the pain never leaves in any way. And I think that's really cool. Um, the other thing that I get excited about when it comes to things like cake is this aspect of mutual care. So the concept of caring for someone during and after kinky play, a kinky scene, that just means a time when two people are being kinky together um, because kink doesn't always involve sex per se. Um, it can be completely not involving genital stimulus, but it could still feel hot and naughty to you without needing that. So people use terms like play or scene to be encompassing that idea. Um, so after a scene, there's this concept of aftercare where you realize you've just had a really intense experience with someone else, you were really super vulnerable, and then you reconnect in a different way, maybe you like cuddling, whatever. You reconnect in a different way to kind of come back to your normal everyday self. And in this, this painting was actually inspired by something that's totally real. I'm gonna just let you guys know. Um, I have a disability in both my hands, right? And there are times when I am in so much pain, I literally cannot pick up a fork. And I personally greatly dislike being fed because of the way society infantilizes disabled people and treats us as less than if we need things like this. Um, so I had a partner once who was like, well, what if you just beg for it like a little puppy? And I was like, well, pup play's not really my thing, but that sounds way more fun because suddenly it's not a burden I'm putting on someone else at all. Like it's something both people are getting something out of. We're both having fun and I get my needs met, which is really cool. Like that is something that I wouldn't experience without the possibility of kink for myself. And that's what inspired this painting. And none of the people look like the people who are actually in the thing. It's more like the emotion. But you can see the woman who's about to eat this ravioli that the other person is holding over them is like, like she's into it, it feels hot to her. And that's kind of the point, like this person is acting as a dominant role while still 
giving food to their submissive, like caring for them, being an act of service as the dominant role. And the thing about kink is when it's really good, it's not about trying to be like the way somebody else does it. It's about figuring out what does it for you and what does it for your partner and doing that. And so if similar, but the other way around, if trimming someone's beard feels naughty to you, like that could be the way you express your sexuality. That gets to be what, what you want, if that's what you want. And that's beautiful. And that, that's a classic example of an act of service. And in this painting, which I titled For My King, we have a naked man um, straddling a man with long dreads and a low beard and a shirt. And the naked man on top is trimming the other man's beard. And what I like about this painting is it shows the power dynamic in the other direction, where the more submissive person is caring for the dominant. And so you can sit there and be dominant in your power and be cared for. And that can be part of kink too, to just be like, you know, you want to, and they want to because they actually do. Um, it's kind of, it's really something I explore a lot in my work is the power dynamics that are possible in kink and how we can explore that and how I as a disabled person whose body might at one minute be able to hold up my own weight and at another minute could not, I can still engage in the fullness of myself and my pleasure. And that's what I really like about kink. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna breathe for a minute because that I know I went through a lot of stuff really fast. Mm. There, we'll go here. Um, this is more like a loving, cuddly, could even be platonic moment, but I'm taking a mental breather, so. Um, yeah, I think that um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine and he became disabled later in life and um, was having challenges with his sexuality. And I'm like, okay, tell me what you're doing. And, and they told me that they were being really physical and really like, uh, and trying to like show their physical strength, which that isn't possible in the same way as it used to be. And I was never physical and strong in that way. So I've always had to approach it slightly differently. Um, but I was speaking to them, I was like, but do you feel like in your person when you're just hanging out, are you like, does your personality feel like it's really important to you to be physical and strong and, and muscly all the time? Or do you actually enjoy as a person feeling soft and gentle and like squishy. And the, this person totally admitted that they, they love feeling soft. And I'm like, okay, you, like you like the gentleness, the softness, the gentle seduction, right? And so I'm like, okay, then why are you falling back into old habits? You're, you're acting like you used to. And, and that's the thing is like, if you try to be who you were when you were 17, no matter who you are, if you're not 17 anymore, it's not going to be the same. And as we age, we're, if you live long enough, you're going to become disabled regardless. So if it's not relevant to you today, it will become relevant. But like your body changes. And if you're always trying to be who you were or who you thought you were supposed to be, then you don't get to enjoy who you are now. And what I like about kink as a way of exploring sexuality is the idea of exploration itself is really celebrated and you don't have to do the same thing. It's not about the surprise of, oh, I didn't know we were gonna have sex and now we do and that's exciting. I'm like, yeah, that can be cool. But like, or it can be totally planned in every way because you have to save your energy, which I definitely do. And I need like a day off beforehand, but and it can be hotter because you're exploring what your body is now. You're not exploring what you thought you should be or what you were. And so that's what I said to my friend. I was like, I, what if you explored 
your softness, your gentleness, and you could have it just as hot, but maybe it was slower. And maybe the tension of it being slower made it even more fun. And that's what I really love about kink for disabled people is that it's so adaptive and it's so responsive. And honestly, some of the best doms I've ever had were chronically ill and disabled as hell and good for them. Um, but I, I had a friend recently say they thought I could be a good dom. And I was like, oh, thank you. But nobody's ever said that to me before. And we talked about why. And then we talked about how as a person with a disability, you have a really good understanding of kind of sensation and comfort and how discomfort is different from pain and the, the space between different types of pleasure. Like there's a big difference in my body from the level of discomfort I'm feeling currently right now to if someone like harmed the shoulder that just got in a car accident. Um, like that's a big space of difference, but there's also a difference between that and thinking and what that feels like. They, they all have a different sensation. And I had a dom once very chronically ill who was very good at reading that difference of sensation because they had experienced it so often. And they could see if I was, my body was shaking, not because it shakes all the time, which it does. So it's hard, <laughs> like I get it, it can be hard. But they could see that like, no, I was actually putting my weight on my arms and my arms were giving out because they don't have the same stamina as other people. And so rather than it being something I had to monitor and I had to take care of myself around, they would just be like, hey, Rachel, what if you stop putting your weight on your arms right now? And I'd be like, oh, that's a great idea. Thanks, I'll do that. And so the, the making sure that I was okay through the experience wasn't just my responsibility. And it wasn't that I put it on someone else because I never do. It's because it's really hard to teach people. Um, but it's more that they already knew because they had experienced themselves what it felt like to have these different sensations and that like if all I did was move, we could be somewhere way more fun. And I, one of the things I really like about the pre-negotiation, the discussion of consent is this concept of uh, safe words and like traditional ones are red light, yellow light, red lights like we're done. I gotta stop. Yellow lights like, hold on, no more of this thing. Generally, I mean, everyone makes terms themselves, but those are stereotypical ideas. And for myself, I, um, I don't always speak all the way through, I just noticed. Um, some, and so I developed nonverbal cues. And one of them would be like a yellow light, like we just discussed, and I do like a siren, I open my hand and close it over and over. And so I don't have to say anything. And the other person knows and I don't have to think so much. And so I can feel safer. And the other person is also safer because they're getting that communication from me. You know that the dominant needs the same amount of safety as the submissive because when we, when we explore new things together, we can hurt each other if we're not careful. But if we are careful, we can have a lot of fun. So another thing I thought about for a long time is how to communicate to somebody else that I need to move my body because of my disability. Because my body physically changes in sensation from day to day or moment to moment. So what I do is I'll like double tap their arm. And the reason that is, is I don't feel sexy being like, hey guys, I have a disability accommodation and because of that, I need to do these things right now. Like that's just too many words. Um, and so it's much easier for me to have a double tap. I do know some people who would, who would ask for their needs to be met and be like, mistress, may I move to the different position? And that could be fun, like if that works for you. It doesn't work for me because I have a lot of trauma around not getting my disability access needs met. And so by having a different way of expressing that need, 
where I don't have to ask a question that I need the answer to be yes, no matter who you are. Then I can tell the other person what my access need is that I need to move. And we don't even have to have a conversation and I always know that my needs will be met and they always know that they're gonna help keep me safe. And then we can explore these really deep, intense, sometimes physically painful in a good way moments. And we can go there and we can be checking in on each other throughout in a way that really enforces our own safety, but allows us to not break the moment, which I think is fun. Um, yeah, does anyone have questions? I feel like I just talked for a chunk of time. If not, I can, I can keep going on. I just... Um, I think that the, the whole concept of pre-negotiation and before you ever have sex with someone or kink or both to talk about both your desires and where your boundaries are is something that would be beautiful if everybody saw that, if everybody was able to enjoy that. Cause I, I, you know, you know, there's sometimes you don't talk about it first and you have a sexy experience with someone and it goes great. But there's a lot of times where it's actually kind of stressful because you're guessing what the other person wants or they're guessing what you want and it just doesn't work. And if we have that pre-negotiation, you don't, you don't have to guess what your partner wants or what they like. They'll tell you like, this is what's 100% on the table. This is what's a maybe and these are the circumstances. And this is what's a no. And if they tell you this is a no, like, I don't, I don't play with that. I don't play around the fear of that. Like, no, personally, I never do anything that has to do with medical stuff because doctors have really harmed me. If that works for other people, good for you. Have a great time. But like, that's one of my boundaries. And so we don't do medical stuff. And if that's someone's like main thing, I don't play with them. But it does mean I can find people who actually are into what I'm into if I'm able to have that pre-negotiation. And you never, and I think that somebody had brought up if that would work for neurodivergent people as well. And I, I actually have a couple of neurodivergencies. I don't talk about it very often, but I have CPTSD and depression and anxiety. And yeah, it works well for neurodivergency as well. But I think even if you are totally able-bodied, the pre-negotiation is helpful because it helps you establish consent with your partner and you know where their boundaries are. So you're not gonna accidentally step all over them. And it also helps you establish, you know, being able to share what your actual pleasures are, not just what people think it's supposed to be. Um, but as someone with neurodivergencies, some of my boundaries are around my mental health. And not doing medical play is definitely one of those. It's a boundary that protects my mental health and allows me to have fun. Yes. Informed consent would be amazing for pretty much every interaction, 100%. I love that. You want to read off that question, Laura? I need a break. Yes. Uh, thank you, Badly Look Bear. Uh, question Do you have an opinion on the differences in practice between RAC and TIC? R A C K and T I C K. I'm going to admit to being really, really terrible at acronyms. Yes. And if you could define those terms for us, that would be great. I assume it has to do with their acronyms around how to get consent. Um, oh, am I muted? Is somebody yes. muted? A risk aware consensual kink versus trauma informed consensual kink. Yeah, I, I can get on chat for a second. Um, yeah, yeah so like, share with us about that. So like we've moved from like uh, safe from like the the past, which is the like safe, sane, and consensual, which was like a really problematic term be, because it like because of the implications. We're not of all sane. Hi, and how also, are you? yeah, and also it didn't in, embrace. Um, 
like that some of the things that we do are dangerous. They're inherently dangerous. At the same time, they're consensual. And so then everyone kind of moved to this rack model. And then now I'm encountering people, um, including educators who have moved to a trauma-informed consensual kink model. I can, I'm an educator, so I consider myself to be a trauma-informed educator in my classroom, mm -hmm. but I'm not a kink educator or a BDSM educator um, professionally. So, um, and I was just wondering, based on, you know, your knowledge of the topic and your focus, if you had an opinion on, on tick, basically, but I'm not quite sure it's a term that's being widely used. And I'm looking, I'm looking a little more about it. I thought you might know, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's a really fair question. Um, the trouble is that I, um, I'm not really part of the kink scene, the part that like goes out at night and meets people um, because I go to sleep really early since I have a disability. Um, so I know disabled people who are, so I don't, I didn't come up through the kink community with this language, which is super useful to have. And so I, I don't actually have um, a thorough answer for you because of that, unfortunately. Um, I will say personally that when I talk to somebody else, I will always believe their account of their own body and their own mind because I can never know what it's like to be you. And I ask that of whoever tries to play with me, that they understand my account of myself and believe it, even if they've never experienced anything like it. Um, when that comes to trauma, I think that's really important because then you can understand like, this, this is the part where I could hurt. This is where we could actually step on that by accident. Um, and this is what we can do to not hurt around that. Like there's certain phrases that I prefer people don't use because they remind me of somebody. And if I am able to negotiate that in advance and be like, I'd rather call you call me this, then we don't have to hurt each other by accident. And that's my approach. Um, but I'm sure people like who are educators around this definitely would have a more thorough answer. Yeah, I'm speaking from a place as an artist and also a disabled kinkster and someone who has a lot of disabled kinkster friends, but I don't like hold classes around it. Um, it's more one-on-one um, -on -one experience with different people. Um, yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you for your question. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Did anyone else have anything you'd like to ask? Oh, somebody, uh, Jennifer is saying, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, sorry. You go for it. Okay. Uh, Jennifer's asking, how do you handle it when somebody is not listening well? Um, so I try to do these pre-negotiation talks around my sexuality well before I actually want to have sex with someone, like on a whole different day, um, just to kind of feel out while we're dating or getting to know each other, are we even compatible? And so if in the beginning stages of a relationship, someone isn't listening well, I honestly wouldn't feel comfortable playing with them. That said, if it's somebody you've been with for a while and they're having a moment and they're not listening well, that's a, kind of a different story. Um, but even so, like if you're not on the same page, uh, there are things that I wouldn't feel comfortable going to. Like I, I might feel more comfortable with certain parts of my sexuality than with others because some of the parts are really physically or emotionally vulnerable. And I only want to be physically and emotionally vulnerable with someone who can handle that. Um, and they show me they can handle that by listening and by being observant, but also by asking questions. And I really try to encourage people to ask me questions from a place of curiosity, not from a place of like, well, how can you make art and be disabled? 
like a little, uh, but more like a, how can I interact with you in a way that you would actually enjoy? Is there anything I should not do because it wouldn't work well for you personally? Those kinds of questions I find really useful. And if I find I'm miscommunicating with somebody, I really try to encourage them to ask me questions because me trying to psychically read what's going on with them is not going to work any more than it would work the other way around. Um, and maybe they're like going through some stuff. That might be a good question for me to ask them. But yeah, I uh, think there there is a risk of hurting me when people do kink with me, do sex with me, whatever. When people hug me, even there's a risk, and the risk is higher depending on what we do. But there's also doesn't have to be that harm if someone listens. And so I don't put myself in as much risk with someone who's not listening. And that's, that's pretty much the answer to that. I really wish I was working on new paintings. Oh Aww. my God. Yeah, Abe just asked if I was working on any new paintings or artwork or what's inspiring my new ideas. Uh, this shoulder sprain is taking a long time recovering because doctors are not listening like the person above. Ooh, my art process. So I, uh, I think about kind of a feeling or an idea that I want to express based on something I've experienced or witnessed. And then I, sometimes I'll get images from Instagram or wherever trying to show that feeling. And with this painting, as we are, the feeling was really about being hot and sexy as hell as you are, even if you don't look Instagram pretty or whatever society is telling you you're supposed to be, if you're actually in yourself. And the way these two people are interacting, both of them have thick fat rolls and they are hot as hell. And that was the feeling I wanted to put into this. Um, an idea I hope to work on next is about it's a little more naughty, but um, it's about one woman riding another and the person on the bottom is holding the person on the top up by their hands like this by pushing their hands on their sternum. And so that's actually something that I've experienced and I can't always hold my weight up by myself, but does, that doesn't mean I can't be on top. Like someone can support me and that support can be part of our naughty interaction and that's fun. And that was the emotion I wanted to share. And I very rarely make my paintings look like whoever was originally involved because it's not about portraiture for me. It's about expressing this emotion and it's about trying to draw people into a sensation they may not usually feel. You know, like I really, I like it when people who have experienced this see themselves in my art, like that's beautiful. But it's also really cool when someone who's never experienced kink or disability or queer sexuality starts to, starts to see it in a different way. And that's why I'm trying to be really, like I, I see all this, oppression that I experienced personally and worse that my peers experienced. And I've made art that tries to address that directly and it's really painful for me. And so instead my process is to show what if disabled queer people were seen as we actually are? Like, what if you saw us not for how society tells you we are, but how we actually are and look how freaking beautiful we are. Uh, another question. Did your internet stop? Uh, no, do you want me to read that for you? Actually, can I read it? Oh, go away. Yeah, read it. Um, if your, your tastes in kink includes bondage and suspension and how, if so, how that is for you regarding your kind of range of sensations and your and your disability? Um, I personally do not do rope play at all. 
I, I did know a professional rope shibari artist and he was able to tie a harness around my hips in such a way that didn't bite on any of my fat or muscles because it was very evenly distributed weight and like hold me up like this. I felt like I was flying. That was cool because I got to experience like this is what other people get out of it. But that was the level of skill I personally would need to be safe because I have to be able to move my upper body randomly. And I don't actually know when that's going to be in advance. It could be in two minutes. It could be right now. That's part of why I'm like shifting around a lot is I'm, I'm actively uncomfortable all of the time. So movement helps. Um, but I, I do, I do know people who like, Oh, were you asking a second question about sensation? I just, I'm curious because this is a question that's been asked of me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a sexological body worker and I'm a, f a former pro aerialist. And so people often have been like, well, what about suspension? Like, what about supporting? Um, right. You no, know, what about supporting bodies in sort of arousing ways? Um, mm -hmm. people, people who are limited in terms of their mobility or who have um, pain with certain movements, I totally hear that restraint doesn't work for you. But just in terms of like supporting and making different positioning available, it's, um, I'm a, I'm very much, yeah, a, I'm also pretty small bodied. And so suspension has been helpful to me in some moments to, to be able to move. Yeah, for sure. And I'm just curious how that is for you. And like there, there are sex swings I, that people use for similar reasons, either as a top or a bottom, um, because I, they're a little less like hard to get out of, but I, I did know other people who had disabilities or neurodivergencies who really enjoyed suspension and rope play because you had this like sensation of just release and calm. Hmm. And I, I actually saw that and they were able to kind of shut their brain off in a way they didn't usually get to do in everyday life and just like chill out and not have to be always thinking, always in control. And they really like that. And the thing is, Rope play is like a high skill activity. If you, especially if you want to do it with someone with a disability, but even if you don't, if you're a nerd and you love researching things, rope play is great because then you get to research and learn and become an expert and do great things. Um, but it, it takes a, a lot of skill. And then to incorporate that rope play into a scene, which has feelings and emotions that work for those people and isn't just like mechanical, because mm -hmm. that's just mechanics. Um, that's another skill, but like different things about CDSM have different, um, levels of entry for how hard they are to learn, but also depending on how your brain works. So totally. any you, people can learn lots of skills. It's like, sometimes you have to take a little while to learn on your own and come back. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Have you ever incorporated your art making process into your kink? Like painting people? <laughs> oh my God, that would be amazing. Uh, I have not because I have to paint in a very particular way. I have to paint really, really quickly and then take like 30 minute breaks and do it again and only do it in a three hour stretch because using my hands is a practice of endurance. It's not really a practice of technique. Um, but I definitely have done the other way around. This one is called, it's about boot blacking, which is like an act of service where someone polishes someone's shoes for them. Uh, which also reminded me of the way that sometimes disabled people need to be cared for by having someone take off their shoes. And it, I found it really cool that both of these concepts kind of look the same. And that's why I was trying to incorporate that in this painting. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. I think that a thing I really like to show in my art is the desirability and the hotness of disabled people. I think that as a society, we are often infantilized, treated like children, treated like we don't understand ourselves, or our own bodies, just treated genuinely less than. And we're not. 
I don't, I don't care what your depth ability is. I don't care what your neurodivergence is in, in case of value. Your value is inherent, you exist. And so you have value. Um, and so my way of pushing back against the way society, like I'll be at the doctors and they'll treat me like, I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, my way of pushing back is to show our desirability, to show our sexiness, but also to show that mutual care that it's not about being a burden to someone else. It's about we both care for each other. Who is another question? I'm going to read this out loud because it's amazing. Olivia's writing. Yeah. A friend of mine is a disability advocate in Belgium, and one of their job duties is facilitating and learning from open conversations between sex workers about disability and access in their work. It's really inspiring, and I wish we had something like that here. They're actually tracking things that sex workers talk about running into with clientele and expanding access to the information within the public. That's amazing. I love that so much. Belgium is just a better place. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, God. I can't with America sometimes, but... A lot of times um but that's really beautiful i i've actually there are professional doms in this world that you can hire um and there are professional rope artists that you can uh pay to play with and they won't have sex with you because that's where the legality gets there um but you can have a kinky scene and i did meet someone who was a professional dom and she was saying how like a few percent of her clients are disabled or neurodivergent and we're a quarter of the population. So that's like, we're already a huge amount of the population. And then there's a huge amount of us who are cases. And I think that it's really cool to have someone like a professional dom as, as a resource because then they would have the skill set to really know how to respond without having to learn a whole bunch of extra skills. Like I told her once, this shoulder is messed up. And she's like, yes, and now I will remember that for the remainder of the time you're in front of me. And I was like, because even I will forget like another person's body where exactly they hurt right to left because the spatial awareness changes or, or you're caught up in a moment, you know? But because it was her job, because she was professional at it and she was good at it, she could remember. You tell her this part of me hurts, she'll remember and she won't bug it. And that's, that's a skill set. And I, I do wish that we had treated sex workers like workers because they work hard and they're great. And, you know, professional doms, they are great people too. So they do good work. But the communication thing about like, maybe a person forgets what side of my body is hurting today, or maybe they forget I'm like, I'm at a point in my life where I'm not even mad about them forgetting as long as they're trying because I can't remember stuff. I'm on a lot of medication. My brain memory is terrible. So finding a way to communicate that without it becoming a thing so that they understand and then remember is really helpful. And that's part of why I do the double tap on the arm. If someone's like, pushing on my shoulder. I can even do that when we're out in public. If they forget and hug me on this side, I can double tap their arm and they'll be like, oh my bad. And I, I will do that with my friends. So this is this, this habit that I developed because of my kinky play that I bring just into regular daily life as a way to communicate with people. This part of me is not okay. Like you don't have to touch that. Um, so I think that's really cool. This painting here was, is uh, kind of hard to see because it's more abstract, but there's um, a person who's about a foot taller on the left looking down at a person who's like staring up at them um, with their titties out. They're looking at each other like this. Um, and I really like messing with gender in my paintings because as someone who's pansexual, I think gender is silly. And it's a social norm I did not sign up for. I understand that it really is embodying for some people and that's great and I support that. But for myself, I just don't get it. But I think that by messing with gender so that you could read this as a man and a woman, as a, two women, as a woman and a gender queer person, it kind of unlocks this concept that there must be 
a certain pairing for sexuality to work. And uh, I like that. I, I like that. I, I find it. I mean, sometimes I do try to intentionally make certain genders. Like I tried to make this look like two men, though it is in pink. Um, but even then, people will see a man and a woman, and I'll be like, but which one is the woman, though? And they sometimes say it's the one with the beard, and then that's really interesting. Um, but playing with gender and trying to show queerness just in any kind of intimate interaction is really a big part of my art because as someone who is queer, I want to show that like it's not this assumption of man and woman isn't the only way I experience life. And I do still play with men. So it's not that they're off the table. It's just, it's not the only version. And even if you have two queer people who are both cisgendered of the opposite gender, you can still have a queer sexual interaction. And that's a really big part of my art. Um, yeah, I think this is a good, painting in a kind of a different direction to just sort of pause on at the end because it's about it's about mutual care um and that is part of kink like actually caring for each other and aftercare is part of kink but this this is not even about sexuality for me this is just about mutual care as as a fundamental part of the disabled community we care for each other i care for people who are able-bodied like mutual care and that way nobody's a burden no nobody's too much if we're all caring for each other um and that yes yeah, that's that's what this painting means to me and uh it's titled hold my mind broken body um because it was about a time when my mind broke because kaiser wouldn't let me go on disability so at the end, we all care for each other. Oh, Pamela, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to talk about sexy things and disabled people because we never do. I'm going to oh. grab this one out loud too. This is again from Olivia. Do it. Um, one other thing I wanted to share in regards to neurodiversity and kink from an ADHD kinkster friend of mine is the idea of writing down each step in a scene in specific order while establishing the boundaries. It apparently works really well for this friend, at least, and now they're doing a lot of eroticized written instruction with partners. That's so cute. That's awesome. I mean, because it's, like it's like a written version of saying like, hey, babe, I want to try this and this and this with you. And mm -hmm. like... It, in like a rom-com view of sexuality, asking for you want is like a no-no and isn't sexy and breaks the moment. But if you write it hot, that could be very hot. And I love that. That's great. Aw, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to show that like my body comes with my access needs. So my access needs are part of my sexuality just as much as any other part of my life. And um, that can be hot that in and of itself can be hot too like I tell people I have bondage built in you don't need to tie me up I ain't going nowhere like but that's also why I like the mental aspect of domination because it's like yeah you could physically overpower me but that's not very hard because of me but if you can overpower my mind I'm stubborn as hell like that's impressive good job um so that's why that does it for me but yeah we don't talk about sexuality and disability very often. Society doesn't want to believe that's real and it is real and it's hot and it's beautiful. And I think society spends a lot of time telling us who we are and who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to look and who we're supposed to treat and who we're supposed to be with. But like when you're able to tap into like who you really are and what you want, which is really hard in America, um, that you can find connections that are real, even if they're just for fun because you're tapping into yourself and not who you think you're supposed to be. And then like me as a disabled person, I don't feel lacking when it comes to sexuality. I don't even, like I, I miss not, not being in pain all the time, but when it comes to my sexuality, I don't feel lacking because I now know myself so much better than I did. 
and that I can tap into things I never had access to. Like Pamela had asked about sensation and I know people who have lost sensation in huge amounts of their body and it's sad. But then they're like, I know people who have hypersensitivities in parts of their body. So if you like touch them in a area that's not sexual towards other people, it could be sexual for them if you did it right. And that's really cool because then your body, because of its differences, have new naughty things you can tap into. And my friend has lost a lot of sensation. They had a partner who was like, okay, this whole left side, you can't feel? Well, look, we have this whole other side to play with. Like, look at this huge canvas. And society wants to talk about disability in terms of lack. And there are a huge amount of things I can't do. I can't work more than 24 hours. I can't drive myself right now. Like there are a huge amount of things I legitimately can't do. And that's part of why I'm so comfortable calling myself disabled. Like I just can't, and I'm not gonna pretend that I can't, but I don't have to be lacking because of that. I can be amazing and celebratory and we can be hot as people, as disabled people, because we're not lacking. We have so much because of the different way we experience and think about the world. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this with us. This is wonderful. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I'm really happy I got to share this with you and share my art with you because I kind of think visually, which is half of why this has been painted. Thanks, Olivia. It was great hearing all your questions. And uh, it was really like, nice meeting all of you. I um, we still have a couple minutes if anyone else has questions, but I think I've said my piece. <laughs> oh, thank you, Badly Lick. Did you do you want me to hit, read that for you, or you get it? Thanks, Bear. Sure. Badly, do you want to read that? Just thank you. This is really this has been a really lovely chat. Um, it's really nice to hear about your work and and as somebody who you know um has a lot of kinky experiences with people who are disabled who has medical disabilities myself and also deals a lot with neurodiversity in the community um this is just really you just you're really good at talking about it from a very particular from your from your own perspective i don't know it's just really refreshing and lovely to hear you talk about it and um yeah and the work is great the work Thank is really you. nice Thanks, Bear. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, you know, my daily life is hard. Discrimination is hard. And so finding the things that we can celebrate about ourselves, I think is important. Because I'm not, I'm not going to pretend the heart isn't there. And there are moments in my art that you can see that, the hardness and the pain and like, that last painting had a lot of sorrow in it, but like, it also has the beauty. And I think that's, that, that those are the kinds of talks we don't hear as often is like, how are we beautiful? How can we celebrate who we are? And this one is of the why things. opulent mobility was cool. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's one of the reasons why it was so exciting to include your work in there, because that kind of joyous celebration of the disabled body is just not what we're seeing yeah. an awful lot of. And I love that. And that's what we want. You know, like we want to have something that isn't just tragedy. And it isn't just, oh, look what those people can do, which is creepy. Um, and it isn't that inspiration, whatever, either. And isn't that so patronizing and awful? But can't we talk about, from real, what is, but also what is glorious? Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. oh, Sarah did raise a roof on that one. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, opulent thanks. mobility for those of you who don't know um, is an art show that's been going on for like ten years that Laura is the curator of, and uh, really celebrates how fabulous disabled people are. You probably have other words about that, but yeah, well, no, that, that, of course, but yeah, it's about it's about reimagining disability as opulent and powerful, which is not these are not yeah. things you associate disability with. And since this is bringing in the work of, of a lot of disability and disability adjacent artists, <laughs> or people are really close to it, even if they're not necessarily yeah. identifying that way, um, about 
entirely different ones. And it's one of the things I loved so much about sharing that. This last one was, there were several pieces about medication and about mm -hmm. mental health and about physical disabilities of all kinds and mental ones, right? All the things. This yeah. is great. And, and medication is something that's beautiful because it's, it's part of how I survive. So I got no beef with my meds. It's all I good. I don't like all of my meds. Eh, well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we do the best we can. Absolutely. But this is great. And I, I think we are now at, yes, indeed, we're just over. So well done you, right in the time. Thank you. And thank you to thank everybody, everybody for being part of this. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was so amazing. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate thank you, you all for hosting this and giving me this time. Oh, thank okay. you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Very sweet. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah.